This is Joe Layden from Cowboys and Indians Magazine, and I am pleased as punch to be talking today to Tom Blythe, who rides tall in the title role of Billy the Kid, the new series starting April 24th on the Epics Cable Network. Uh, well, how do you do, Tom? Hello, Joe. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so um, you passed the first test. You look comfortable on a horse. That's good. good. That's the bare minimum. That's what I need to do. <laughs> but but how difficult? Because I'm looking over your uh, your resume here, and I I don't see too many westerns, uh, no, or even period pieces that call for horseback riding. Lots of period pieces, none that call for horseback riding. Um, so this was this was definitely a first. Actually, my my first ever job as a feral child number five in Robin Hood that Ridley Scott directed a few years. Uh, a long time ago, probably 10 years ago, um, I was supposed to ride and they never ended up putting me on a horse. They, had, they ended up making us um, these like hobbit feet out of prosthetic feet. So we were all running through the forest. Um, so, you know, I should have, the fate, the fate was aligned. I was supposed to ride a horse and then 10 years later, I got to do it. So uh, we got there in the end. But yeah, no, I, uh, I hadn't really ridden before. I'd, I'd ridden twice in my life, really. The first time was when I was very young at like, nine or 10 years old and I fell off and I was kind of traumatized. Um, I think if you speak to anyone who learns to ride, if they fall off early on, it can be quite a traumatizing experience. Um, however, I then got back on the horse when I was about 18, when I was doing a play in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, and that was also a fairly, fairly scary experience because the horse wasn't very well trained. It was, it was a young horse and young horses obviously have a lot more energy and uh, tend to be less patient with their riders. Um, so then when this job came around, I was, I was living a slightly, slightly uh, kind of nomadic experience up in the woods of, of the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York. Um, you know, it was still kind of fairly the, the height of the pandemic. And so I was kind of living with my girlfriend at the time in this little cabin in the woods and we were chopping wood every day and, and keeping the fire going. It was kind of very Walden Pond-esque. Uh, and then I got the, I, you know, auditioned and got the job and Luckily, I knew someone down the road who has a, had a ranch who rescues these mustangs, these wild mustangs from from the kill pen down in, on the southern border. Um, and she has about a dozen wild mustangs that she has uh, taken in. And they're all like, you know, these horses have like varying levels of PTSD themselves. So she kind of she she looks after them. She brings them back to full health and then she trains them and then she uses those horses to uh, to help people with PTSD, like veterans and things. Um, so she's she's a very good person to teach you to ride because she's very patient because she's used to working with people and horses who both have PTSD. So uh, so she taught me to ride for like three weeks before we started filming. I just I went and I asked her. I said, "Look, I need to I need to be good in a horse. I need to get there and know what I'm doing. I can't embarrass myself." And so uh, she did. Bless her. She gave me she gave me a real kind of um, crash course. Uh, and then I got up there and luckily we were surrounded by real cowboys because we were filming in Canadian cowboy country in uh, Alberta. And it, I mean, it was so authentic. The minute I got there, they put me on a horse and I rode off for like three hours in the plains with six cowboys around me. I felt like I was part of a posse. It was, you know, <laughs> incredibly authentic. <laughs> that was a long winded answer of saying before I didn't ride. Oh, no, 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 look, this is Cowboys in Indians magazine, you know. That's true. I mean, that's true. You know, people people eat up stories about horses with a spoon, you know. Good, good. Uh, well, speaking of fate, I mean, you were born in Nottingham, so I guess it, it was, you know, you were destined to be in at least one Robin Hood movie. I mean, uh, after a period, I of was, yeah. And it's funny because, you know, my first ever job was in, was in a Robin Hood movie. Uh, as practically a glorified extra. And then, you know, my first kind of big American job, this side of the pond, was as someone who I consider like the American Robin Hood. Um, so it's, it's kind of funny how things have come around in that way. Well, now, while you were growing up, uh, years ago, I was talking to Alan Rickman before he did the Western uh, Quigley Down Under. Yeah, right. And he confessed that when he was a boy, you know, he used to play cowboy, you know, growing up in England and had this cat pistol that, you know, would never go off correctly. And you know, <laughs> he was very happy that, you know, he got at least a good gun in, in, in Quigley Down Under. Uh, when you were a lad, uh, were you a fan of Westerns? Oh, big time, big time. That's why this feels so kind of fateful. Um, it's funny, Michael Hurst, who created the show, is from the north of England. And so I grew up in Yorkshire in the, in the north. Um, and 
I, I like have distinct, distinct memories of growing up on the weekends in the summer, playing, you know, quote unquote, cowboys and Indians and, 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 you know, playing shoot 'em up. And, and I had a little toy revolver and those kind of toy guns that you talked about. And he's right. You know, the, cap, the caps didn't ever go off. They would like every other one would go off and you'd feel like you'd had a misfire. Um, yeah, it, it was, yeah, it was such a big part of my childhood. I, I played Cowboys and Indians growing up all the time. I had figurines. I had like, you know, I think it probably started when I was a kid with like a, a Woody from Toy Story figurine I think I had was like my first cowboy figure. And then from there, it kind of probably became a bit more mature. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's funny how, how big a part of my childhood it was and Michael Hurst, the creator, having both grown up in Yorkshire in the North, which couldn't, you know, on paper, couldn't really be much further away from the Old West. But I think that is a homage to how powerful the imagination is, you know? It's like, and then also to a certain extent, like the North of England has these big, you know, ranging fields and and hills and woodlands. And I remember that being such a big part of me formulating my my kind of imagination, this kind of slight wilderness, like as wild as England can can be really. Um, and And then reading Western books and, books about westerns and and kind of bridging that gap in my mind as a child and also uh, I've told this story before but there's um a big part of me like we then moved down to further south and I grew up like in the suburbs of a city when I was a teenager and I would I was kind of a latchkey kid you know do you guys have that phrase latchkey oh kid? yes definitely, yeah. definitely. okay cool cool well, I, was, I was one of those because my mom worked a lot and she was a single parent and um so I would stop my grandma was a was a, uh, a librarian she ran a library and so I would stop on the way home from school and I'd go in and I'd, I'd waste the hours that I had spare while I waited for my mum to come home um, so that I didn't have to go home and clean up the dog poop because we had an old dog who pooped everywhere um, so I would I would stop to avoid having to be the one who had to who got home first good excuse stop. good excuse yeah, yeah. yeah exactly exactly mum I'm reading it's good for me <laughs> <laughs> I would stop at the library and, and my grandma was working the last few hours of the, of the, of the working day and I just sit in the corner and almost all the books I remember reading were Western books. They were, you know, either fiction or nonfiction about the old West. Um, and so there's, there's kind of throughout my childhood, there's been and growing up, there's been these kind of little nods and these little links. And, and uh, it, when the job came across my email inbox, it just made sense immediately. The moment I read the script, I thought, Oh man, I, I feel like my imagination and my kind of, my childhood play like self, which is, you know, as an actor, your, your main tool, it, it's already primed for this, you know, it already felt ready for it. Well, now you're playing an iconic character. Yeah. But you are playing an iconic character in this particular story, in this particular take on the story. And I remember something, you know, Malcolm McDowell told me years ago when he played H.G. Wells in a movie time after time that, uh, you know, uh, he said, well, I'm, I'm going to read up on, on H.G. Wells. And if you ever remember the movie, that H.G. Wells was very shy and very bookish and tongue tied around women and things like mm. that. So he, he picked up this book on H.G. Wells. And the first sentence, the first paragraph was this notorious rake, H.G. Wells, who cut this erotic swath through. You know, and said, OK, I'm not playing that H.G. Wells. I'm playing this H.G. Wells. Uh, how much research did you do about Billy the Kid? And at what point, you know, if you did say, okay, that's nice, but I'm playing this Billy the Kid. Yeah. Uh, to answer your first question, I did a lot. I, I read several books. There's, there's, you know, it's, you're lucky in a way as an actor when you're doing a historic character because there are books out there. There are like accounts of, of the person's life. But also you're unlucky because of that, because it can be, you know, similar to that story, you can feel very beholden to it. And you can almost feel guilt when you realize that the person that you're building that's coming to you kind of somewhat spiritually almost is not who you're reading on the page. But then you almost have to let yourself off the hook because you have to realize that, especially with characters that are somewhat mythologized, I think you have to let yourself off the hook because you have to realize that these are all accounts from people's perspectives and, and perceptions of a person you know if um if in 200 years someone was going to write a book about about your life it wouldn't be a, a an accurate 100 accurate account of who you were as a person or as a spirit it would be someone's perception of you and so i think 
in a way that lets you off the hook because you can remember that that someone was a plethora of things that wouldn't necessarily all be on the page and circumstantially depending on who they're with or what they're doing they might be a different person um so that was kind of answering both your questions but going back to the first question i think you have to start with the research because it's a way in you know when someone is a real historic character you if you start completely from the imagination you're first of all you're doing them a disservice and you kind of feel like you're dishonoring the memory which is just not a good way to start um it doesn't doesn't leave you feeling like you're being authentic so my way in was to read all the books then practice i started gun spinning i started practicing that very early on i, I bought a, a mock gun because i'm in new york state so obviously you know you can only really have these kind of toy guns basically um and so i was practicing with like an aluminium aluminum sorry <laughs> <laughs> aluminum uh, metal gun that was kind of a block of of like a revolver and I was practicing with that and just getting used to it because I, I thought like the main thing was this is a guy who he's he's in a different world to me he holds himself differently he walks differently so you start with all those physical things pretty early on so you can just get used to them because time is is not on your side when you're making a tv show or a movie um, so that the sooner you can get it into your body the better I think because it, it drops your center of gravity and it changes the way you talk and walk um, but then I, I took a trip to to New Mexico about two weeks before we started shooting. I booked a trip, six day trip, flew out to Arizona, rented a car and then drove through Arizona and through all through New Mexico and up to the top, up to Fort Sumner where he died. Um, and I stopped at Lincoln and Silver City and, and, you know, all those places and and just took it in. Honestly, just walked in kind of his footsteps, so to speak. And doing that, I think, was the most useful thing I could have done because suddenly all these places that I read on the page that were in my imagination were then committed to an actual place. It, it became tangible. It became palpable, you know. Um, and seeing there's a cabin there that is not necessarily the real one. I think it's from a movie, um, but it's in the same place where he he lived in Silver City with his mum and and his stepdad Andrew, and. And going inside there, and even though you know the cabin isn't real, you know that it's in the exact spot where it was. Mm -hmm. There's something, there's something magical about that. You know, there's something that connects you to the person. And then same with Lincoln. I mean, if I don't know if you've ever been to Lincoln, New Mexico, but it is it is a one road town in and out. You know, there's one exit and one entrance, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's in this gorgeous valley where the sun rises and is like a blood red and and sets and is like this d deep, deep kind of almost like orangey purpley color and there's something truly magical about it and and it allows your imagination just to go wild with with the kind of questions of what it would have been like to be there at that time and all of those things I think asking questions is the best thing you can do you don't even necessarily have to find the answers but if you can ask the questions it starts to make the, the gears turn and then your imagination starts to play and then it's like the book, the reading and, and all the research that you've done meets the kind of childlike imagination. And when those two things mesh together, I think that's when you start to really feel connected to the character. Well, now, as part of your research, did you look at earlier film versions of the Billy the Kid story? And, and A, did you think, oh, well, that's interesting. I might want to try that. But also B, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I don't want to go anywhere near doing that <laughs> it's it's always a temptation um i've played now in the past two years i've played two historic characters and it's always tempting to go and look at people who have portrayed them before or attempt to kind of do uh you know do, do, do more research than you need to i think for this one particularly i actively chose not to watch anything and I, I, amazingly i've gone my whole life without seeing um oh god what's the emilio estevez uh, or Young Guns. Young Guns, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I had a mind blank then. Um, Amazed somehow gone my whole life without seeing Young Guns. So all the left-handed gun, these kind of legendary Westerns. And I grew up loving Westerns. I watched them all the time. But I just somehow had missed the Billy the Kid ones, which, again, felt kind of fateful because when I asked myself that question, do I want to go and watch other people's versions, the answer was like a resounding no, because it can be so easy to then, even if you don't mean to, to kind of absorb some of that performance or some of those traits, and you want it to be yours, you want to feel like, you know, it's your embodiment of this character without someone else's voice in your ear. And so a short answer is no, I didn't. Um, however, I did meet Emilio Estevez recently, um, and, and we spoke about Billy the Kid, and 
uh, <laughs> I was very embarrassed that I hadn't yet watched John Guns uh, and, and kept it very quiet. <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't read this interview and find out that I was lying. <laughs> but, but, you know, he was, um, he was very graceful and lovely and, and supportive and, uh, and I want to watch it. I'm just going to time it out carefully when I'm not in the middle of playing the character or even thinking about the character because I just don't want to get infected with somebody else's amazing performance. Now, again, playing this iconic character, uh, do you remember the day, I mean, and, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm going to give the game away too much. We don't hear him referring to himself as Billy the Kid, you know. Uh, mm. uh, but do you remember the, the, the first day when you had to identify yourself on camera as, you know, I'm William H. Bonney? Uh, you know, like I've talked to actors who the first time they had to say, I'm Bond, James Bond. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's a simple line, but it's like, you know, to be or not to be, you're gonna. Yeah, that's so true. That's a really good question, man. I love that question. Um, God, I, I, I do remember, I can't remember which scene it was now, but I do remember kind of getting chills and also getting kind of like, the fear because it, it's a it's a moment of realization where you go holy crap I really am playing this person you know you say that you say the name out loud and and a name is powerful I think I think a name you know we go our whole lives saying our own name and it has weight to us but we're immune to it because we've been saying it our whole lives so when you have to say somebody else's especially someone who has that kind of stature in history it, yeah it is a powerful thing to say I am William H Bonney I'm trying to think where where I was. I don't remember. It must have been in the first the first few weeks, but I think we were later on because I kind of came in two weeks into shooting because there's a young kid, Joe Nicolia, yeah. who plays young Billy for the first episode, um, and kind of a big flashback period. And so I was on set watching him work and kind of forgot that I was playing Billy for a week, and then suddenly had to come in and got dropped in the middle of it. And I was like, whoa! I forgot that it's not just that little kid; it's me. Um, and so yeah, I remember. I remember it just hitting me like a like a, a freight train that I was like I was this man. Um, but then very quickly, you say it a few more times, and you start to take ownership over it, and it starts to feel like a powerful thing. You know, it starts to feel like a way in. There were there were moments where if I ever felt like I was losing the character or losing touch with with the story, all I had to do was like spin a gun for a second and put it in my holster and say the name, and, and suddenly you're like, oh yeah, that's that's who I am. You know, it's that's who he is at his essence. Um, yeah, but he's also funny because he's he's like a he had a lot of names. He went by a lot of different names um, early in his life, and so one minute I'd be saying William H. Bonney, the next minute I'd be saying you know Kid Antrim or or um, William Antrim or Billy Antrim, like all these names he kind of he went through, he cycled through, and obviously part of that was survival because most of his life he was on the run. But the other part of that I think speaks to your previous question, which is you know who is he historically there are all these books but but this is a man who went by like at least four five maybe even six different names in just 21 years and so that does something to you I think it means he probably was someone who wore many hats you know metaphorically speaking he probably did have several different personalities and actually the books support that because people both describe him as charismatic and having a twinkle in his eye and someone who could break into a laugh at any moment in the middle of the most serious thing, but also someone who was thoughtful and intellectual and could sing and 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 was well read at a time when most people weren't well read. Um, people talk about him reading Shakespeare in school and stuff. So he is kind of enigmatic in that way, which actually gives you more license to really just find your version of the character because he is kind of a legend and a myth. Yeah, it is kind of startling when, when you start reading Song of Myself your ailing brother but then you know there are the stories that he was a quite a well-read you know for his time erudite you know yeah yeah uh, uh this movie or well i say movie this show this, this series uh places more emphasis i think on his being an immigrant son than any other billy the kid uh, story I've heard, and, and of course, being an immigrant son myself from Ireland, my father from Ireland. Uh, I thought, oh, this is interesting. Uh, how how big a thing was that in your perception of the character? The idea of 
you know, here's somebody who came to this other country like you <laughs> yep. uh, to pursue a dream. Uh, in your case, the, the dream has not turned into a nightmare yet. I mean, uh, but, 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 Let's keep idea, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the idea that, uh, you know, uh, for all the country's faults, maybe, you know, I mean, America still has this attraction, you know, people come here, uh, but he is, you know, over the course of the story, somewhat disillusioned about this. Was that a, a, an important uh, thing to emphasize in your performance, you think? Yeah, it's huge. I think it's, it kind of is the backbone of at least the first half of the first series, I think is it's the backbone of this, the driving force, you know? Um, mainly because Michael has written this beautiful, this beautiful version of the story on the page that is, a, you know, it's the whole series, at least season one, is asking the question, why did this person become who he became? You know, who, who, is, who is he underneath the killer that we have, we've all heard of? Who is he underneath, the, to an extent, the mass murderer, you know? Um, he, you can't ignore the fact, if you're asking that question, you can't ignore the fact that his family came from the potato famine in Ireland and, and had nothing and were promised a better life in America. They got to America, they faced, you know, belittlement and racism and, and lived in slums in New York and, and could barely put bread on the table. And then from there, they were promised, oh, actually things will be better out West. If you go out West, all those promises you've been waiting for will come true. And they got there and it was a mud pit, you know, it was like barely, you know, these towns were barely built. There were people just like scrounging and scrapping for, for like a little bit of land and a little bit of hope. And, and so these were people who were constantly promised things, constantly promised a better life and never given it or never, not even given it because they were willing to build it themselves. They weren't even given the tools to build it. Um, and so I think that does something to the human psyche, which is, a, you know, like you said, a lot of the, the things we talk about in America now is like, how, what are those lasting effects that, that it has on a people? Um, and I think you can't look at who Billy was without looking at that because essentially he had to become completely self-sufficient and kind of say enough with the system of, of this of this world that hasn't been working for me I'm going to build this life for myself and so he did especially you know once spoiler alert his he gets orphaned at a young age and is, is a, an orphan in his early teens and and so he he has to build a life for himself and really what that meant at the time was kind of looking at alternative ways to fend for himself and so he did what had to be done and so I guess to answer your question more precisely I think America is an immigrant story right like this you know everyone who came here like you said including you and me came here or our, or our ancestors came here with a dream of something better and so that I think that that speaks to people innately I think everyone can understand that feeling of of even if you were born here, hoping that this might be the land that gives you something, something richer than what you're used to, you know, and I, I can relate to that personally, because it's I, my whole life, I wanted to come to America, I always had this just pull, I don't know why, I don't know where it came from, I'm sure if I looked into it, there's probably dozens of reasons, but ult ultimately, I just knew I had this, this pull to come to America and be an actor here, and I knew that this was where I was gonna, gonna tell stories, I just had a feeling, I don't know why, um, and, and Michael Hurst can relate to that. I'm, I'm sure you can relate to that, given your family's background. And I think most people who watch the show will understand what that means, because somewhere in their, you know, their family's life, because this country is so young, that's a recent story. People coming here and, and seeking a better life and most of the time having to face hardship to do that. Sorry, that was a really long way of answering your question. No, 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 no. no. Now, um, I don't want to give any spoilers. Yeah, but uh, there is an episode in the first season. Uh, for the first time, Billy kills a man in cold blood. Yeah, and I mean, before that, he you know shot at people in self defense. He was you know tried or was going to be tried before he escaped. You know uh, because he, he inadvertently you know shot a man. You know, how do, you, how do you rev yourself up for that? I mean, you know, again, you know, this is the, this is a turning point. I think you could say this is the turning point in the Billy the Kid mythos. Mm. You know, and, and, and the series doesn't make, you know, a big deal out of it with dramatic music and, you know, things like that. But 
you look at that and then the you know the aftermath you go okay he, he's definitely going over the line here hmm. there's no coming back uh, sorry so you say how do i rev myself up for yeah, that the, you know, moment, the kind of the pinnacle moment of change you mean yeah yes that's another good question. <laughs> um, I mean, if you spoke to any of my castmates, they'll tell you that I'm kind of a bit of a wild thing on set. I, I like if I have a scene like that, I'll I'll take myself off and uh, and and you know we were filming on location the whole time. Nothing, not a single shot was shot in a studio, which was a blessing for me because uh, I wanted to be as authentic as possible. Which for me b- means being able to like get down in the dust and, and put it, you know, hold the dust in my hands and put some on my face and, and, and get mucky with it, get messy. Um, and so that's a big part of it. I'll, 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 you know, I'll take myself off. I have a playlist of music, of, like a, a playlist of Billy the Kid music that I've made over the past few months before filming and, and it's different songs for different moments that will help me find the moment. Um, but really, I mean, it all comes from the script, honestly, the script is so good and so rich and Michael's, writing you can almost like you can smell you can smell the world at different points i remember the first time i read it i i I could smell the mud of coffeeville kansas when when he said you know the the wagon train rides into coffeeville for the first time and it's just mud and like this putrid stench i could smell it it was so rich and so i guess i'm saying you just trust the writing as much as you can but yeah I, i think it is a turning point i think that point where you know he first kills um is, is a huge turning point. And I think for me, what's really important in this show from the start, especially this, this first season, and you know, we'll see where it goes because I think there will be space for him to get more, more callous and more violent as time goes on, as he has to face up to the fact that the world is against him. But in this first season, it was really important that he, he's not immediately a sociopath. He's not a psychopath, you know? He, like, he's not this, he was, he's not a born killer. Like, because I don't believe that anybody is, I think it's circumstantial. I think you grow up and, and people are damaged and, and hardened by the world that they grow up in. And so what Michael and I, I think really talked a lot about was who he is versus who he becomes, you know, or who, who he is as a young boy growing up with this very loving mother who really ta- taught him a lot and cared for him and gave him all the tools to become a, a really kind of good young man in society. And then, of course, life had other plans and stripped a lot of that away from him. And so it was vital to us that, that he's not callous to begin with, that there is there are these changes throughout the, the first season and beyond. And I think, you know, Michael has plans for three seasons and uh, as it is right now. And we have to have somewhere to go. You know, he has to have he has to have a kind of an end point like the Billy we see at the end before Again, spoiler alert, but at some point he dies. <laughs> uh, but it's historic. Allegedly. Stuff. Allegedly. Well, allegedly, yeah. We, let's not wade into that debate right now. But <laughs> uh, but yeah, he, um, he will die eventually. And it's like, who will he be then versus who he is now? I think that's what the show is about, is seeing him become this man, become this killer. That's what's so interesting about it. And that's something we haven't seen before. Usually we see in the movies that have come before this, we see him as he already is. We, we haven't gotten to see the origin story, so to speak. Well, uh, Tom, you've been very generous with your time. Thank you very much. And congratulations on the series. Thank you. And I don't want to give any spoiler alerts, but uh, I'm looking forward to season two. <laughs> so am I. So am I already. <laughs> Thank you and happy trails. Thank you so much, Joe. You too. All the best.